Hello, I'm Allison Clarkson, one of your three Windsor District Senators. I serve on as Vice Chair of Senate Economic Development and in the Government Operations Committee. And today we're here to give you an update on where the legislature is and where we are with the coronavirus response. We're uh, staying masked, uh, except when speaking. Uh, I'm Dick McCormick. I'm one of your three Windsor County Senators. I serve on appropriations with Alice Netka, and I also serve on health and welfare. I'm Senator Alice Netka from Ludlow. I serve as the Vice Chair of the Judiciary Committee and of the Appropriations Committee. On March 13th, our governor signed an emergency declaration and put us into a state of emergency in order to contain the coronavirus pandemic and spread. And little did we know what would happen. Uh, we uh, suffered a, an earthquake uh, of, of economic uh, challenge as a result as we closed down businesses left, right, and center. Events were closed, business, uh, government, schools. We, uh, in order to uh, contain the virus, we, we worked very hard on, on complying with the governor's order to stay home and stay safe. And we revolutionized the way we did business as a result. Uh, we immediately, in sort of over the next few weeks, all, over 100,000 Vermonters went on to unemployment. Our unemployment numbers went from 2.4% to over 16%. And uh, in Congress passed three significant uh, coronavirus relief packages, which the Vermont, with every other state, was a beneficiary of. Uh, and we had the opportunity to appropriate $1.25 billion in order to respond and help relieve Vermonters from this crisis. We uh, have never, I think, since the Depression suffered the anxiety and stress that Vermonters have suffered in the, with the loss of their jobs, with business, with redoing and rethinking how we do business together. And we uh, have uh, we have worked closely together to try and respond to this crisis and uh, move move forward and move Vermont forward, although it's been a real challenge. Uh, we are uh, in, each of us worked in different committees. So the first thing that happened is that we had to learn how to work remotely. Uh, and never did we appreciate how interconnected our entire economy and our society was, our schools, our businesses, our childcare, our internet, our food security, or lack thereof. And uh, we responded, had to respond quickly on absolutely all those areas. And in this, in, in this moment, we are reminded that government at its best helps care for its people, which both the federal government did to its credit and Vermont did as well. Uh, we. In economic development, we, uh, although we had passed, we had already done quite a few things before the pandemic hit us. We were at the town meeting uh, period, at the crossover period, we'd already overridden the governor's veto of the minimum wage, which means the minimum wage will be going up uh, in the next two years to $12.55. Uh, we had already uh, passed a paid family leave law, which was vetoed, uh, and we, we had done actually quite a bit of work on many other bills that you'll hear a bit about, but we had to pivot immediately to the response and relief of the coronavirus. Uh, it was, as you heard, like an earthquake. We are still suffering the aftershocks of that work. It's been a massive disruption to our life here in Vermont, uh, to all of our work, to our education, to manufacturing, to our tourists, tourism and agriculture communities and businesses. Uh, in economic development, we uh, immediately moved to expand uh, unemployment insurance uh, eligibility. We worked and created workers' comp so that businesses wouldn't be liable uh, for coronavirus illnesses. And we built a huge COVID uh, relief package uh, that coupled with the federal opportunities, we Vermonters received over a billion dollars in PPP, payroll uh, protection program money, 
uh, and we uh, allocated over $174 million to different businesses, uh, aimed particularly at businesses that had lost the most uh, in, in this huge disruption. And uh, in, we also worked in, to create a housing response. Uh, we had toured the state and were already very clear on housing needs, but overnight we had to house 2,000 homeless, homeless Vermonters. And what has come out of that uh, is, is, is wonderful in that we, not, not one homeless person got uh, coronavirus, uh, as opposed to Boston, where a third of their homeless population got COVID. But we uh, have just moved $85 million to respond to rental, for rental assistance, to build new affordable housing, uh, to deal with our homeless population, to rehab uh, homes that needed extra help to make them habitable, to uh, allow for more accessory dwelling units and, uh, and, and make changes in parking for downtowns. But we have rental assistance for renters and, uh, and landlords, and we have foreclosure assistance for people who, uh, whose mortgages are challenged, who are finding it a challenge to meet their mortgages. In government operations, we enabled, we spent the first time just enabling government to function by, by allowing remote meeting and uh, helping businesses and, and, and government meet remotely. We uh, created a vote by mail opportunity so that we can both for our primaries and for our elections vote by mail because all our poll workers, our clerks, uh, everyone and uh, our voters are all challenged by staying healthy and safe during this pandemic. And we have just had a huge response in the primary to uh, people's ability to vote and, and interest in voting by mail. We digitized land records. We worked on our systemic racism, which we had put into place, and we're uh, expanding that work and on law enforcement, on emergency, uh, our emergency uh, management teams and, uh, and hazard pay. Uh, we have done, we have worked uh, enormously to try and make uh, our response effective and, and to help Vermonters who are hurting so completely and at this time. So uh, with that, I, I, is that a, at least a start for an overview? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, good. My turn? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the Senate, we serve on two committees, and I mentioned uh, that Alice and I serve on, on appropriations. I also serve on health and welfare. And in an epidemic, uh, obviously the health committee uh, is, is dead center on the issue. And because there have been devastating economic consequences of the pandemic, the welfare committee um, is, and when we don't just deal with welfare we deal with all all various uh ways the government pays attention to, to people's needs uh so the appropriations committee looks to the other committees for guidance the appropriations committee has a proposed budget to deal with it's developed initially a proposal was developed by the governor's office and then it comes from the House first. In the Senate, we now have we have a, a budget to look at and, and what to do with that. The Senate Appropriations Committee always looks to the other committees for because they're looking at each aspect of the budget more closely than the than the Appropriations Committee can. And um, in this case, the real question was what to do with the $1.25 billion of, of federal money, which we have in response to the um, uh, to the COVID crisis, uh, I want to make a couple of points about all that that federal money. One is it is federal money and it comes with federal strings attached, and there are various um, uh, issues uh, involved with that that have caused citizens a great deal of anger. I think perhaps just anger, and um, in some cases there's literally nothing we at the state level can do about it. It's the money's coming from the feds and it comes on their terms. Uh, but the other thing is, is that um, no one can tell the future. Even in the best of times, we do something called a Budget Adjustment Act in the middle of the fiscal year because no one can tell the future. In this case, the future is especially unknowable. And so what we decided to do 
was when the fiscal year starts, we're now in fiscal year 2021, it started July 1st, that we would pass a budget just for the first quarter. And uh, we refer to that uh, offhandedly as the skinny budget. And that the legislature will be reconvening on the 25th of August via Zoom uh, to, to uh, develop the budget lay, uh, later. And one of our major themes all along, right back in March, has been flexibility. Because this is big and it's full of surprises. Uh, so the, anyway, the, so I'm going to talk first about health and welfare and our recommendations to, to appropriations, and then, and then uh, we'll, we'll look at the actual uh, appropriations. We focused, and I think the Appropriations Committee and the Senate as a whole, the legislature as a whole, has, has agreed, as, as reflected in what we passed, uh, we, we, that we have to deal with health care providers, the actual doctors, nurses, and, and when you go though, down the list, uh, you say doctors and nurses, that's the beginning of a very long list of people who provide uh, health care. Uh, uh, mental health, child care, and child care again is a long list, including parent-child centers. Uh, we wanted to spend, give special attention to vulnerable populations, most notably the elderly, uh, people over, over 65, which is to say <laughs> includes your, your Senate delegation. Um, uh, food vulnerability and uh, one of the things I want to mention is that this this crisis has really ripped the the, the screen back from uh, problems that have been there all along in some cases we have problems that are caused by the uh, epidemic some are worsened by the epidemic but many have just have been there all along and are exposed by this and one of them is that a lot of people are food insecure in Vermont um, and then um, we have um, new Americans living here. Some people have a sort of animosity towards them, but these are our fellow human beings and they're among us. And the civilized people do not allow people among them to, to suffer undo, unduly. Uh, so that's the, um, the health and welfare input. The other thing I wanna mention, and I'm not sure, I, we are very much in agreement on pretty much everything we're talking about. I, I, I speak for myself on this, and I, I don't speak for my colleagues. I don't know if they agree with me or not. But one of the bits of testimony we got in health and welfare that was adamant was we cannot, in good conscience, reopen our schools unless we're ready. And I'm not saying we're not, but uh, I'm not convinced that we are. And for me, the measure of whether or not we can entrust the health of our children and our teachers and our staffs and everyone in their families and circle of friends because if people get contaminated, they become vectors and they carry it, uh, is, is that the, the measure is do, uh, we in the legislature are still on Zoom. Uh, if we can entrust uh, the health and safety to the school protocols that are being proposed, then the measure of that is do we trust them for ourselves? Um, we had adamant testimony from, from teachers, uh, including their designated collective bargaining agent, the NEA, that, um, that they, are, they are not confident at this point that the schools should be reopened. Well, the governor has put off the reopening till the 8th of uh, September. So we have some time. And maybe, in fact, uh, 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 protocols will be developed. So I'll hand it off to... Uh, the vice chair of appropriations. Well, let's see. Um, my morning committee is judiciary. And in that, uh, we actually have a lot of bills that usually move right along, that a lot of bills from other committees come there because there's maybe a, a piece of the law that needs to be addressed that's other than the standard. You know, there might be a, a penalty or something like that that needs to be looked at. But anyway, um, we worked a lot this year on justice reinvestment, which we have worked on for several years with the Council of State Governments, who um, give us a lot of guidance and also help financially if we're taking up topics that they're working on as well. So one of the one of the big topics was reducing the prison population, uh, given that it's a very costly endeavor and we want it to be as effective as possible in terms of um, 
retraining those in prison, rehabilitating them if, if there's uh, issues that need to be addressed, and, and of course many do have major issues, a lot of them are drug related. Having um, drug treatment now in prison is, a pos is okay to do now, it wasn't in many, year many years ago. Um, also, and getting them on their feet so that when they do get out, they will successfully re-enter the community and not immediately be returned to prison. It's not easy to have all the services in the community available, and Justice Reinvestment is helping us to get money and to set up services so that when someone comes out, um, the services are available to keep them out. Also, there's a huge issue with persons uh, suffering from mental illness who wind up in the prison system because there isn't an alternative system for them. There is a small one, it's very limited, and so they are, this is not the proper housing for them because they aren't really getting the treatment that they need. So that's a big issue for people. While I'm talking about that, um, this, you know, just recently we passed uh, a big um, a policing bill to change how some things are done with the police, and it also addresses um, the racism problem that we've all become aware of all around the country, if you weren't aware of it already. And that, um, we did pass a bill in 2017, and this now we're building on that to improve areas where we know there are deficiencies. We've hired a chair, she has a bigger title than that. What is our, our director of our racial director equity. of racial equity, a great person with a lot of knowledge, and she's going to. That was a time limited position. We did extend that, so that will be ongoing. Uh, the other thing was, um, the other thing is making um, the issue of racism, making the need for how to change it available to across state government, and looking at all the state agencies and where is their racism occurring and addressing it. And we ourselves in the legislature um, have taken some trainings as well that even if you think you don't have any issues, uh, they're very informative and help you to look at things a little bit differently. So that's, that will be ongoing. The other thing that people keep asking about are body cameras. Now this is a big issue and we know that many police departments around our state have body cameras and they've been a very big help not only to the police but to those who's, who are arrested and the footage is seen. and. You know, sometimes I, I know from working with the courts that somebody, somebody says, oh, I didn't do that, I didn't do that, I didn't do that, and the, their lawyer shows them the body camera tweeting and they say, ooh, I guess, I'll, I guess I'll agree to a plea bargain or plead guilty <laughs> because they've, they've seen it. Mm. The state police do not have body cameras, but they do have patrol car cameras, and they also have a voice, a voice recorder on. But as of August 1st, the state police are to get body cameras, and they're in the process of that already. Um, the issue always has been that they said in their budget they could not afford to buy the foot to store the footage and you know because if they're recording everything it costs a fortune. That has all changed with some newer technology and it's not not as difficult as it was and of course small police departments have been storing it or they've, however they've been storing it either on a thumb drive or in the cloud. So that's going to be happening and the um, there's going to be we already, several years ago, I think 2017, passed a bill with regard to body cameras and what can be recorded, what can't be recorded. For instance, if you think about um, a situation regarding a child, that is all private business because these days with transparency, everybody wants all of the footage and obviously it would not be proper to have someone's intimate domestic violence action recorded and put out there on the internet. The same thing with children. So there are uh, limitations as to what can be shown to the public and there should be. So I'll, I'll, let's go back on to where we were. Of course, I've been working on the budget with Dick and our committee and all the other committees as well. We spent a fortune, we spent in one week, I think we put out uh, $570 million out of the 1.25 that came from the federal government. It was great that we could get it out in that timely manner and we did save some money because we want to see what's going to be happening when we go back in August. And that's, of course, as Dick said, we did the three-month budget, and that's uh, why we did that, because we, don't, we didn't get all of the revenue in until July 15th because we extended the income tax deadline as well. So those are many of the issues going on. I think that um, reaction to the pandemic, other than what happened with the unemployment insurance, uh, was worked out pretty well. 
And I mean, there are a lot of people left out, and there's terrible suffering still going on. And so we're going to try to address some of those issues in the budget that we do when we go back. So. Well, uh, for me, I think one of the, I think no one appreciated that the trust in public health is critical to our economy recovering. And so for people who are frustrated about wearing masks, I mean, wearing masks equals public health equals an, a, a, an, an economy that is hopefully going to recover. All of us, no matter what political stripe you are, want the economy yeah. uh, back uh, uh, being productive and, and earning the revenue that we have just, that we have lost. <laughs> and uh, getting, as people say, back to normal. And yet we are suffering more aftershocks. I applaud Vermont for doing such a good job. If you haven't read Bill McKibben's article on, in The New Yorker about how Vermont has done during this pandemic, uh, he applauds us as the, as the other states. I mean, we have the, one of the best records, period, of how we've responded, how we've been able to contain the virus. And uh, it's, we, we have done a pretty darn good job. And now we have to really begin to rebuild and recover our economy which is what our, our work has been, has been about in the State House. Um, are there lessons that you too have sort of, I, yeah. I just yeah. would like to say uh, throughout the pandemic and everybody's work, I would like to say that the legislature worked very closely with the governor and his team. And I think that showed in terms of the things we were able to accomplish. It was not, you know, we're of, we're of different parties, but that, that doesn't matter when it comes to really working on things for the state and helping the people. Oh, so it, I think that was ab absolutely. absolutely. Vermont happen. Strong yeah. has no party. Vermont yeah. Strong is pulling together and right. rowing together. Yeah. And I think that's what people understand uh, with that. I, I do want to, first of all, I echo that. I, I am, I've always loved and been proud of Vermont, never as much as now. This is the people, and we could start now and go on for an hour listing the things that, 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 that people have done right. We do have a couple of problems. First of all, there were bureaucratic hangups that continue to this moment of people trying to get the aid they were promised, who need that aid and are just sitting listening to, to piped in music on hold. And when we go back, we're going to have to address that. Um, there, there are some very serious bureaucratic uh, uh, snafus, but uh, but again, good for the governor, good for us. We have worked together, I think. And but I I think that underscores one of the lessons learned, which is we cannot let uh, our our technology capabilities lapse. Mm -hmm. So our biggest challenge with the unemployment insurance problem, and the reason so many of you had problems, and so many of us had problems mm -hmm. helping you, is we we're dealing with a thirty year old mainframe. I mean. That is inexcusable because we never, what we've realized is we cannot afford to have allowed such an important uh, division of our state government to fall so far behind techno technologically. And um, it, it, that, that was just a, a, a huge challenge. And now we hold our breath uh, waiting for the federal government to find its bipartisan mojo and come together to extend aid because uh, every one of us needs this m needs money injected into the economy right now. This is not a time to starve the economy. This is a time to help families stay on their own two feet and uh, be able to function and uh, to reduce that pandemic unemployment uh, insurance at the at this moment. It is really going to be a huge challenge. So we are hopeful and, and also hopeful that there'll be money for state and municipal government because all of uh, state and municipal government is suffering huge revenue losses. Uh, in the first month uh, of our pandemic in Vermont, businesses uh, lost over $300 million. That's just in the first month. Uh, the revenue losses that we're looking at that we have to make up in state government at the moment are uh, uh, close to $300 million in the state budget, which is, which is huge because if people aren't earning money, they aren't paying taxes. If people aren't buying things, there are no taxes being collected. Uh, and that is 
uh, you know, it's it's uh, the revenue loss means we don't have money for 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 everything from schools to mental health to. So just when you mentioned schools, it reminds me that we did put in money for education into the education fund so that we didn't have to raise that tax based right. upon. What so got perhaps done. you'd like to speak to the tax rate because we work really hard well, to keep the tax rate level. We work very hard by putting all the funds in there. And uh, the transportation is at their fund balance is zero, but we do have money to help pay for education. And we also put a lot of money in with regard to the pandemic and COVID-19 to cover like cleaning and all that stuff. There still is more needed, but there is a big chunk that went in there out of the money that we received previously. So we, the school dilemma is we're having a meeting tomorrow about it with statewide. Uh, it's a very difficult situation. So I don't really know yet what's going to be happening. Yeah. It's different around the state, and a lot of teams are looking at it. Right. So the $26 million we have already appropriated for local governments uh, to respond, and that's the local governments to help pay for hazard pay, for their emergency yeah. um, staff, and, and for all the things, the expenses they've had to pay to, uh, res to be able to function healthily and safely. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just a drop in the bucket in terms of what uh, will be the... the the needs that they have going forward. One of the challenges with federal money, with our CARES Act money, is that it cannot be spent to replace revenue you just lost. It has to be spent on uh, COVID-related um, expenses, yep. new expenses that you've incurred, and it has to be spent by December right. 30th. So this is one of the biggest challenges yep. uh, that we had in allocating and appropriating this money. Uh, we had lofty th goals, uh, for example, with hazard pay, yeah. with housing, with, with economic development. We were hoping to be able to spend this money in, d in different ways and, and were reined in considerably by the restrictions that are placed on, on the COVID spending. Yeah. Uh, one he, of the who, great he who pays the fiddler calls the turn. The, the turn. That's right. <laughs> so one of the great successes in to go to health and welfare has been the expansion of telemedicine. Yes. And perhaps, Dick... I mean, that is, you know, there are lessons learned that have come out of the pandemic. And, and one of the great things that we're going to be, you know, we've always wanted to expand telemedicine, but this has been our opportunity both to fund it and to, uh, to actually enact it. Yeah, I think, I think we're about out of time. So that's a, probably another problem. We got a five minute warning about 10 minutes ago. So <laughs> I think you actually did address it already. Alex. Right, oh, okay. Any, anything you wanna, anything well, else, Patrick? Thanks for listening. <laughs> the, the, more to continue. August 25th, we go back. Right. Yep. Thank you for hearing us out.